Uh, we are here to talk about equity and fair play. Um, and we have some incredible humans here with us this evening. Um, and now I'm gonna introduce myself. That was not the, the segue I meant, but uh, <laughs> my name is Lisa Viscusi. I'm the manager of adult learning at the Frick. Um, and again, so happy that you're here tonight on this beautiful evening. Um, and if you had some people that you wanted to come or wanted to see this after, after you hear us, um, you are going to be able to do that on um, the Frick's uh, YouTube page. You can see the, this recording at, another, at a later date. Um, before we do anything, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. The Frick Pittsburgh occupies ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. As a place of history and nature, the Frick recognizes the cultural importance of land and the role of cultural institutions in the formation of collective memory. Displacement and erasure are not just histories for native peoples. Land acknowledgements, like historic sites themselves, are exercises in preservation and reconciliation engaged with the past, present, and future. Um, so uh, I have so many people to introduce, I'm very excited, um, but I also want to point out before I do that, that you are able to see closed captions on your screen. There was an instruction at the beginning that showed you how to do that. and. Um, they should be on right now, and if they're in your way for any reason, you, you can hover over them and move them around your screen. Also, we're going to be com um, communicating via chat this evening, and I see there are two chat, uh, two, two messages in there. Um, and you can ask questions, make comments. If you need any technical help, you cannot see her, but she is there behind, this, behind the scenes, Amanda Gillen. My lovely colleague is here for, uh, to support us um, and will also be able to help you as well. And there will be a Q&A at the end, but if you have questions, you're, you're welcome to throw them in the chat at any time. If it's the right time to answer them, we will do it. Um, otherwise, we will, we will do our very best to get to them at the end. And, and that is all for, for the logistics. Um, before we get to our panel discussion, I want to invite well, first, let me invite everyone on the panel and Heather Arne to come to the screen, if you will. Um, you can turn on your videos and your audio. Hello. Good evening, <laughs> friends. <laughs> Hello, friends. I kind of want to take like a one of those collage pictures of us, like frame it. Um, so Heather Arne, hi Heather. She is a, an incredible human um, and we're lucky to have her here in Pittsburgh. Um, this program, along with two upcoming panels, um, one in which Heather is the moderator for, um, on September 9th and September 16th, they're part of a partnership between the Frick and the Women and Girls Foundation in Pittsburgh. And we're just really lucky to have made this relationship with an organization doing the important work of educating and empowering young girls. And I'm going to not say more about your organization because I'll let you do that. You do it best. Um, so the current, our current exhibition at the Frick is Sporting Fashion, Outdoor Girls. It's uh, Sporting Fashion from 1800 to 1960. And it offers, and we're, we're, this is an exhibition tied um, program. And the, the show offers a history of women's sporting fashion. And while the ensemble stop in the 60s, our work of looking beyond um, the legacy of women gaining agency over their bodies um, and not counting anyone out never stops. And so this is part of why we're, we're having a panel like this and why we're excited for our upcoming uh, panels as well. And we hope you can make it to the show. Um, everyone's welcome, even from out of town. We're doing it safe, so come on over. Um, but I want to, again, Welcome Heather um, to say a few words and then I will do uh, have the honor of introducing our panel. Uh, well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and so uh, good evening on behalf of all of us at the Women and Girls Foundation. And uh, we're delighted for, to partner with the Frick on this project and so many other things throughout the year as well. Um, you know, so some of you might be familiar with Women and Girls Foundation. We're 
really a policy action and advocacy organization based here in town. And, you know, we're sort of in the in the business of radicalizing uh, women, girls, and all good humans uh, to engage in systemic change. And uh, and certainly uh, female athletes, femmes, and non-binary folks have, and other marginalized people have been, um, you know, really doing that radical work of even just showing up in spaces where they were not uh, originally invited and um, doing a lot of that through the world of athletics. And, uh, you know, so I think that just very often just existing and competing as an athlete has often been the radical action in and of itself. Um, you know, athletics have been an outlet to express creativity and strength and talent and teamwork and individual and group excellence. Uh, and yet women and femmes have also had to struggle to achieve equal treatment and compensation in these worlds. Uh, this exhibit reminds us of the constraints experienced by bodies and minds and the restrictions and barriers that have been broken down and eroded and demolished uh, by people like Catherine Switzer and Billie Jean King and Venus and Serena Williams and Megan Rapinoe and Skylar Diggins-Smith and most recently, of course, Olympic soccer medalist Quinn. Um, you know, from powerful moments like when the Yale University women's crew in 76 stripped out of their uniforms displaying the words Title IX written across their breasts um, and backs to protest inequitable resources, uh, to Serena Williams often speaking out against the misogynist responses and comments she has to continually experience regarding her own clothing, um, sports, Women's bodies, people's bodies, fashion, freedom, and empowerment have long been intertwined. Uh, so we're really uh, grateful at Women and Girls Foundation to be engaged and uh, inspired and involved in this project, and especially with this panel, uh, who I'm very much in aura of, very big sort of fangirl of Lauren's film, just to say. And um, I'm just really delighted to be here because this issue around Title IX you know, which I know Anya is going to lead this robust conversation, but just to say that, you know, if it weren't for Title IX, you know, many of many girls, young women would not have had the experiences to to be in athletics. And yet there also are limitations. And then we're also seeing Title IX being used sometimes against us. Um, and especially the way that states especially are trying to pass legislation against trans athletes. I just think this conversation is so prescient. And just the last thing I will say is that, you know, if we had any questions in our minds as to whether there were um, still forces interested in policing women's bodies, we did not need to look further than this morning's news uh, to see that. And so when we see things like what's happening in Texas and our own Supreme Court, uh, we're reminded why these fierce activists and athletes are so important and laws like Title IX. So thank you so much. And uh, Lisa, I will now toss back to you. Well, if that wasn't um, an ad for coming to Heather's panel, I don't know what is. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and really, thank you. It's been, I've, it's been a pleasure um, working with Heather and, and her team um, and really getting to know more and more people who are interested in doing, which she said something that I wanted to just um, say to you all is that just existing and competing is a radical effort. And I think what you each of you do is is a radical effort. It's normal and it should be, I don't wanna use the word, overuse the word normalized, but it is a radical thing to do to speak up for yourself and others. So thank you for what you have done and for being here to talk about it. Um, so quickly, I'm just gonna say a few words about, about these incredible humans I see in front of me. And I have to say, I love this time of day to do panels because the sun does shine in on me and I'm like, this is what I'm, what's, what's supposed to be happening right now. It's perfect. <laughs> so um, I want to start by welcoming Anya Alvarez. Hi, Anya. She is our illustrious moderator today. And um, we came to her through um, a wonderful Pittsburgh presence, Natalie Bensavenga and Heather Arne um, brought Anya to us. So we're, we're really excited. And then she in turn brought Sally and Lauren to us. Um, she is the CEO and, and please, all of you, correct me if I'm wrong about any of your details because it's your life. Um, Anya is the CEO and founder of Major League Girls Creative Lab. 
and is a former LGPA pro with a background in content development. She was the head of content and digital at Athletes Unlimited, and she's worked with everyone from the LPGA to the WHL. She's been a speaker at South by Southwest, and she is passionate about storytelling in women's spaces, which is why she is our moderator this evening. So welcome, Anya. I want to say hi to Lauren um, in Chicago, and Anya's in DC, and Sally is in Colorado. I got okay. it. So see, we're coming from everywhere. That's why I like online sometimes. Um, Lauren is an activist, an author, and a pioneer in a new frontier of gender awareness and equality as producer of the documentary, We Exist, Beyond the Binary, a film exploring life outside the gender binary. Her work sh uh, shatters traditional antiquated constructs that defy gender as either male or female. The conversation around this project started uh, and also an international We Exist movement, which allows those who exist outside the gender binary to also stand up for their recognition. And her work also extends into the athletic arena. She was a division one basketball player at the University of Colorado, yes? Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. Um, and she is an avid runner and activist. She made headlines in 2015 with, I'm sorry, Lauren made headlines in 2015 with their We Run campaign, which advocates for equal space and recognition for non-binary athletes in the world of sports. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. You got almost everything right, except my pronouns are I know. there. <laughs> I have it here. <laughs> I was going to actually say something. So it's fine. I, this is a wonderful learning moment. It is. What, it is. what a great kickoff to the panel. Here Thank you. I'm so glad I messed that up. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I actually heard myself saying it, which I don't know why, because I have it written down and I also am aware of you. And so this is why we're here to learn, right? Exactly. I'm not turning right. Education and action. Is that what you say? Education, so education and action. And action. Yes. yes. Um, and finally, we have Sally Roberts. Hi, Sally. She is the uh, speaker and an author and is a former elite wrestler and combat veteran and the founder of uh, and CEO of Wrestle Like a Girl. Sally was a resident at the Colorado Springs Olympic training camp for eight years, during which she was a three-time Olympic national champion, a World Cup champion, and two-time world bronze medalist, and an Olympic alternative, alt, alternate. Uh, serving six years in the Army, she vol volunteered for deployment to Afghanistan. She was also a member of the Army's prestigious world-class athlete program and represented the U.S. Army and Team USA in elite athletic competitions. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You have all done so many things. I think we can go now. Um, no. <laughs> and I will turn it over to Anya um, to start off this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm excited to be here with two of my friends that I've gotten to know through the world of women's sports. And um, it's, it's always great to see them, even if I can't see them in person. Um, so yeah, I, Lisa, I, you, you did a great job summarizing uh, my background. I Little, a little bit more background though. I have um, yes, I played yes. golf professionally for several years, played collegiately. And as the, as the topic of this panel, it's, it's really uh, resonates with me because without Title IX, I wouldn't be where I am now and would not be doing the type of work that I'm doing now without the opportunity to play sports and to be able to play a full, on a full ride in college at the University of Washington. So that definitely opened up a lot of doors and pathways for me that otherwise I likely wouldn't have had. And because of that, I've gotten to meet remarkable people like Sally, like Lauren. Um, I've gotten to do really cool things like travel to Pakistan with the State Department and learn about uh, gender equality programs that they've started to initiate there through sport. And so I think this is a great opportunity for me to learn more from Sally and from Lauren and the work that they're doing. And I'd love to pass it off to Sally first to give a little bit more uh, background on some of the stuff that she's done. My name is Sally Roberts. And so wrestle like a girl. It, so I wrestled, I had a lot of success. I was in the military, a lot of success. And when I was actually deployed to Afghanistan, I got to interface with young girls that looked just like you and I did when we were younger. And I knew that when I came back, I wanted to have an impact. And 
I wanted it to be supporting girls and women, just like those girls that I saw in Afghanistan, but just like the girls that we see all the time here in the US. And that was where the seed of concept for Wrestle Like a Girl came from was um, that whole notion bloom where you're planted. And what a better way to bring this combat sort of spirit that I have from all of these different worlds to life is by being a CEO and being able to be this really staunch advocate for women and girls and recognizing that there's spaces that we need to have women and girls and there's going to be leadership um, and leaders that come from that. And it, it just really hit me that you shouldn't have a 12 year old girl being her own advocate. They need, we need adults for that. And we need people to step up and, and, uh, and be that voice so that we can open up more doors. And it was through all of these opportunities and through living really big hearted and, and wide open for, for me to say, if I really wanna have an impact, I need to start thinking more strategically. So I'm actually really grateful that my board chair, Mary Ann Bruce has joined this, um, this Zoom and we're gonna be a part of this conversation and we're gonna keep having these tough conversations so that we can do the right thing for these girls and women who are going to be our next generation of leaders. And Lauren, I'm going to pass the ball to you. Uh, that figuratively and literally, <laughs> I actually have a, a, a background in, in basketball, as Lisa um, mentioned. And I, you know, I, I come here obviously with, um, you know, over 10 years of uh, experience advocating for gender identity, specifically um, non-binary and, and, and trans folks, but I'll have to go back all the way to the very early beginning. And I've had a conflicting relationship when it comes to identity, but probably the first identity and whole identity I ever formed was at a very young age, and that was, I am an athlete. And that was something that was so profound for me because it was something that I would carry with me throughout my whole life. And that I felt like I could pour myself into because it was a natural expression of, of who I am and, and who I was back then. And um, subsequently, you know, fell in love with basketball, played it all the way through college, but it was really at that time where, um, you know, I was really coming to terms with who I was and how I identified, which, you know, was outside of the gender norms. And I walked away uh, from a very successful career and basically shut the door on sports and never thought I'd come back. Um, but that, you know, wasn't the path for me. And um, I, you know, at the time, which was, a you know, too early, mid 2000s, when we weren't talking about trans rights, we weren't talking about non-binary issues. Um, one of the biggest, it, one of the biggest issues that the community faced was silence and invisibility. Um, and I saw film as the perfect medium to confront head on um, those two major issues by bringing voices and bringing a face um, and using it as a means for educating. And uh, what I thought was gonna be a documentary uh, has spun into, like I said, uh, nearly a decade of doing work in this space and um, something that was much larger than the film and brought me back into sports. I worked a number of years um, heading up community impact at the Women's Sports Foundation. So uh, specifically programs working with girls and you know, women athletes um, on moving the needle and uh, making change and having impact. Uh, I know we overlapped with Sally and Wrestle Like a Girl, uh, Anya, obviously. So um, lots of similar paths. And you know, today um, I'm you know, back really working as a consultant specifically on trans and non-binary issues. Because as we said, I think we'll talk about, um, there's been a lot of um, backlash, I think, in the movement that is being made. And the time has been critical to, to really step up well, thank you both for, for giving a little bit of more context and, and your background, what you've done. And I want to jump into talking about Title IX specifically and um, and what it has done in terms of the growth and impact in, in women's and girls' sports. Before Title IX was passed in 1972, only one in 28 girls in high school played sports. And now that number is two in five. What type of opportunities did you both have playing sports growing up? And, and how did those opportunities change or evolve over time? I'll start with that one. 
so so growing up, I had a really challenging childhood and I would go out after school and shoplift and I broke into houses and I actually got arrested so many times that I was told by a juvenile detention officer, if I didn't find an after school activity, I would find myself going to juvenile detention. So I tried out for all of the girls sports that were available to me, softball, basketball, volleyball, but I was getting cut from all of them because I didn't know how to play well with others. But that actually wasn't the truth. It was just that I was so hyper aggressive because that was the language that we used in my family. So I looked at the list of after school offerings. I saw that wrestling was a no cut sport. There was absolutely zero girls that wrestled, but I knew that as long as I went out for the team and I didn't quit, that I wouldn't go to juvenile detention. And that was the single biggest, like that was this most important trajectory change that happened to my life. If, if I wouldn't have had that opportunity, if there wouldn't have been a law that said this girl who has no business, um, like there was people that thought that girls didn't have any business being on the wrestling mat. Well, my back was against a wall, literally figuratively. And if the coaches wouldn't have said, well, we have to keep her because there's a law and we could get sued. I mean, that's really why they initially kept me. And what I've learned is that if, if we can get someone to go in there and open up that space and create those opportunities and really soften the ground, we can get more and more girls to come through. And that's, that's what happened with me. So that's how I got started in the sport of wrestling. I ended up taking fifth at Worlds or at Nationals one year. I got a college scholarship. I actually looked back because I got into a master's program and they requested my high school transcripts. I had a 1.09 GPA. I shouldn't have graduated, but I was an athlete and there was this trajectory. And because of that, it helped for me to understand what my skills, gifts, talents, capabilities were. And it, it made it so that I was even able to get into grad school and now I'm running a business. And there are so many great things that have happened because I was able to participate in athletics, but it was because I, I made someone tell me no. And because they never did, I just kept showing up. Lauren, when, when did you start playing basketball and did you play other sports growing up? Yeah, I, you know, I, I played as, as much as I could. I mean, and if there was a sport available, I'm pretty sure my folks signed me up for it. Um, and oftentimes I was, you know, the only girl playing with the boys and there weren't options. And I think that actually caused a little bit of a barrier because I hated feeling different because I already felt so different. <laughs> um, but I, the moment I picked up a basketball, I think I was three years old. I fell in love with it. And then I played a lot of sports and it was around high school when, um, uh, recruiting started and I began to refine and really just focused on basketball because that's what had to happen. But um, I, you know, similar to Sally, I can attribute everything that I am today back to sports. There's just not one thing that I didn't pick up from sports that I don't apply today. It's, it's, it's all of the things. Um, I would say too, one of the one of the areas that was really defining for for me, and I've seen such a positive shift was I'll use basketball as an example. I grew up in an era where the WNBA didn't exist, so you aspired to college, you know, and that was it. it was like I want to play in college, and and or I want to play for the Chicago Bulls, right? Um, and you know, I, I think now what I what I have seen, which has been really positive, is there's the you could girls and women and, and many athletes can aspire to the highest level or, or equitable levels in terms of competition, right? Which I think um, having that from a very young age is a really powerful uh, thing to to hold on to and really recognize what you can do as a you know throughout the course of your life. And I mean, both of you have very interesting backgrounds of how you got into the world of sports. Sally, when you, when obviously wrestling changed your life in a, in a drastic, in a drastic way, when did you decide that you needed to start an organization that propelled women's and girls wrestlings and, and give more opportunities for girls to play that sport? The initial seed of concept for Wrestle Like a Girl came from my experience in Afghanistan when I was walking around with our Pathfinders and I was engaging 
girls that were playing and they just wanted opportunities and there was no one that was going to be a voice for them. And that, that thought was always in the back of my mind. So when I redeployed and I came back and I was wrestling for the Army's world-class athlete program, I was just sitting around thinking there's got to be something I can do. And I didn't have I didn't come with an MBA background. I, I came from a background of athletics. And so I really had to lean on a lot of the people that I knew to get the organization going. But I'll, I'll tell you, like, even where the organization sits today, Wrestle Like a Girl, we're the national advocacy organization for girls and women in the sport of wrestling. We initially just started out doing camps and clinics. And the girls would come to the camps and say, we had so much fun, but what do we do now? And I would say, well, now you can go wrestle in high school. And they're like, yeah, but they're not letting us wrestle in my high school. And I said, who's not letting you wrestle? And so we, I was like, well, how hard could it be to be an advocate? Let's just, let's just start doing the work. And from there they said, well, but we want to go, we want to go to college, but we, we need help. Like, how do we go to college? So that's when we embarked on the journey of getting NCAA emerging sports status. And I thought, well, how hard could it be? And we just took the task on and started to really provide opportunities for girls and women and, and bringing the voice of the girls and women into it. And if, if there was two things that needed to happen, one was that I had to reframe my narrative as a selfish athlete. There was a time when I looked in the mirror and all that I saw was me and what did I need to succeed and what did I need to be to be the best in the world. So I had to do a shift to be able to say, what do they need and how can I help them? And then the second piece was that I, I really had to be fearless. Um, I am so grateful at my naivety when it came to starting a business. Uh, but I'm also incredibly grateful that as athletes, we surround ourselves with some of the best, brilliant minds that we can have. And it's through that teamwork that we start to really raise the level of what it is that we can do, what we can be. And it reinforces that the medals that are around our neck don't define us. They show us what, what it is that we're capable of. And it's up to us to help the dreams of the next generations come to fruition. And as far as when you started Wrestle Like a Girl, how many high schools had wrestling programs for girls? And what is that number now? When we started, there was six states in the entire union from 1999 until 2016 that recognized girls wrestling as an official high school sport. And I am so thrilled to say that as of today, there is 33 states in the U.S. that recognize girls wrestling. And that was done in under six years. That's incredible. And one, one more question specific to that with, with these girls that have learned one that they can wrestle, because I think it's also breaking the stigmatization that they can't wrestle, that it's not a sport for them to do. How have you seen these young women evolve and change and grow in this by just having the opportunity and access to the sport? Opportunity creates interest. So once we were able to get some laws and policies changed so that we could open up these um, opportunities for girls to participate in wrestling, it's, it's really been transformative. And I'll tell people that are not on this panel and they'll be shocked, but to tell you all and to tell the people that are listening, I mean, we have girls that are graduating, that are going, they're finishing high school because there's a reason for them to stay engaged. We have girls that are going on to college for the first time ever because there's collegiate opportunities and they're no longer having to sacrifice between athletics and academics. And they can now choose both just like their male counterparts would have done. We've seen um, girls that have experienced in incredible abuse really come and stand in their own light and shine from within because they know that they can own their space, their voice and their bodies. And these are the things that athletics teach, which is why it's so critical and crucial for us to continue advancing the movement. Lauren, and your background, I, I find really interesting as far as how you ended up getting back into the world of sports. When, when did you first start working with the Women's Sports Foundation? And how has your uh, advocacy around trans and non-binary athletes, what, what type of work did you do with WSF with trans and non-binary athletes there? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, there's actually what there, there are a lot of parallel paths that kind of led to the Women's Sports Foundation. I would say one of the more defining moments was, uh, and, and something I'll never forget, was uh, when Billie Jean King and her partner, um, Al Alana Kloss, actually came to the film premiere um, of We Exist Beyond the Binary, um, which 
you know, obviously it was a significant moment on many levels. You know, the, the, the film confronts the intersection of sports and, and gender identity, um, but then also, you know, it really was uh, a, a moment where as the Women's Sports Foundation, they really saw the value of, you know, another level and layer of, of inclusion um, that was only going to bolster the the work that's being done and the efforts towards gaining more equity and equality for, for girls and women, right? And recognizing that the modern day girl and woman is much more diverse than how it has been traditionally paved and, and defined. And so um, it was kind of at that crossroads where I, you know, right after the film came out and um, there was, you know, a lot of change in the foundation where, you know, they presented this opportunity for me and I had to jump on it. And it was really a shift, a big shift. Um, you know, Sally, as you said, from like looking inward and then to looking outwards, a big shift for me saying, I don't belong in this space. You know, this space doesn't, doesn't include me to what can I do in this space to make it more inclusive, right? For everybody who belongs to it. And it was a really big shift uh, in, in my life, both personally and, and professionally. Um, and so I worked a number of years, like I said, heading up all programs at the Women's Sports Foundation, everywhere from the youth all the way up to the elite and Olympic level, working with some of the best athletes to girls for the first time with very little resources, trying to just sign up for their first class of any sort. And um, the impact of building out that, that pipeline, but more specifically, really working with a lot of those programs to adapt them to, like I said, kind of meet that modern day, either girl and or woman, and or these changing and more diversified gender identities, where when we talk about marginalized communities, this is part of those marginalized communities is we really understand, you know, the Women's Sports Foundation has really understood the value and impact that sports have far beyond the X's and O's, and how can we begin to provide more access and opportunities so that everybody can reap the benefits of that. And um, so a big part of that work was being able to kind of expand upon those programs uh, so they can be more inclusive um, in, today's, in today's world. And, and I, I feel like I'm gonna know the answer to this, but obviously it seems like having more access and more diversified groups feeling welcomed in the space of sports strengthen sports overall and and helps and helps I think people connect more too if they're able to connect to each other through sport yeah 100 percent and we're I know we're gonna be teeing up you know some other great questions when it comes to like diversity across all levels whether it be from like coaching to volunteers all the way down to the participants who are playing yes diversity strengthens everything and you know Sally I'm going to throw this one to you because I think that you have the best example of girls entering the sport of wrestling and what that's done for the sport yeah when when title IX first got enacted there was no female equivalent to the male sporting opportunities the sports that really dug in and invested in the women's opportunities they saw up to 200 percent growth um, this in this current day and age, the sports like wrestling that did not find the value or they didn't see the future with girls and women in the sport, they weren't they weren't pushing it. Um, wrestling at one point was down 250 percent. Like schools were dropping it because there was no female equivalent. And Title IX was a it was really being taken seriously. Uh, and so now that we have women coming into the sport, we now actually today just got another school added at the collegiate level. There's 99 colleges in the US that offer girls and women's wrestling. And that's profound and just as awesome. For instance, this year alone, we're gonna have a wrestle like a girl night at Penn State University, at Oregon State University and at Ohio State University. And it's gonna be for men's wrestling. Like they're recognizing that there's value in including others because it strengthens our sport. It strengthens our communities. It strengthens our nation. And we get that because we learn how to work together cooperatively in a space that, that allows us the space and the grace to really figure out how to, how to work with others. 
Lauren, um, this past year, we have seen about 140 bills proposed in state legislatures that target trans athletes, trans, transgender kids specifically. Um, and a large of those, a large chunk of those bills focus on youth athletes in sports that are transgender. Um, they're arguing that these bills are doing this to protect women's sports and that Title IX justifies the exclusion of trans women in sports because trans women are biologically male. And therefore it takes away opportunities from women and girls that Title IX intended to protect. Why do you feel that there is such a large focus on transgender athletes by legislators? And what type of harm does this, do these type of bills potentially cause in the long run? You served me up a good one there, Anya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna. This this is like a college like mass dissertation, but um, I I'm gonna do my best here. And honestly, like I'm just gonna get frank with this because with these types of questions, you, you really have to. Um, and if we look at what's happening, let me just back a little bit. If we look at what's happening with with sports and legislative legislation. More poignantly, is targeting youth sports, so trans trans kids and, and their families. But if we look at what's happening with sports, it's basically the same script and rhetoric that we saw a couple of years ago when there was a whole fight around bathrooms and trans folks using bathrooms. And if we really wanna break it down, this is rooted in misogyny and the fact that women can't protect themselves and women aren't as strong as men and the men need to protect women. And I'm not gonna get into you know, all, all of that, but it's really based in mis misogyny and, and, and misogynistic tropes that have been played over and over again and now are being implemented into very similar, these attacks against trans kids, the trans community and, and trans athletes. Um, and we see this a lot when women are fighting for equity and equality and being seen as equals in as as athletes. You have Megan Rapinoe, you have a lot of these 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 big time female athletes, women athletes coming out and saying we don't need protection. Like women's sports is is fine, you know. Um, and trying to protect women um, is you know, this, this archetype that keeps being played over and over again. And, you know, it just, you know, I wanted to frame that up as just having like a recognition of these similar patterns and attacks and how they're being used in multiple different ways to attack the trans community and really wielding the protection of, of women and, and misogyny as an undertone and an undercurrent behind all of it. And it's, it, you know, to, to be frank, it's it's disturbing and it's and it's um, troubling to see what's happening. I mean, in Texas alone, there's been 40 bills um, that have been pa uh, proposed that specifically target uh, trans youth, and we all know what's going on with 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 Texas, um, even as of, of recently. And we're talking about a demographic that is the most vulnerable. So you're, you're attacking the most vulnerable with zero statistics, examples, or evidence backing up what they are fighting against and what they are fighting for. Um, and so it's a really, really, really troubling circumstance. And then in addition to that, yeah, you, you bring up Title IX and you know, there's a lot of conflicting messaging about it. I think that Title IX you know, it is intended to support um, and really, you know, help girls and women in sports. And that needs to also include trans girls and women. And really, I think that the nuance there is really recognizing and fully accepting that trans girls and women are girls and women and need to be included in, into that. And I guess piggybacking a little bit off of what Sally talked about in terms of how she saw giving girls access uh, to wrestling, how it changed their lives and empowered them. I would assume that it's similar for trans athletes who need that space to, to gr have growth and to learn and develop those skills that sports can teach. 100% and they've got everything um, 
working against them to, to do that. So for a trans athlete to enter the athletic space, you have to understand that level of passion there because there is so much danger and risk there. They're not there to, you know, have unfair advantages and, you know, tip the tides and I want a medal. They're there for why we're all there, you know, that, that love of, that love of sport and to have those opportunities to express themselves and learn all the things that we learned and, and, and gained from it. And so, um, I think that's, you know, the real importance there. It's like, they're there because they want to be there at the level in which so many others want to be there. And they're also willing to put themselves at risk in order to be there so that they can do what they love or do, you know, what, what they want to, to learn. And the focus has always seemed to be more on uh, trans girls and trans women and never really a focus on trans men as far as uh, limiting their access to playing sports. That, that seems to be a really big focus um, in that space as well. Do we have like another hour? Because I keep going <laughs> about that. <laughs> but yes, yes. And again, it, it just goes back to policing women's bodies. Um, it also has a lot to do with the conversation around the perceived advantages and or not of, of testosterone. And so we're not going to get into that. But yes, that, that is very common um, for a variety of different reasons. With the, with the type of work that you both do, what are the greatest challenges and barriers that you see in regards to providing equal access to diverse individuals playing sports? From the vantage point that I have, it, it's, not, it's not a simple answer because it depends on where you're at, for, at least for me, it depends on where I'm at in the nation. Um, I'm gonna find that if I'm up in the Alaska, we're having a hard time getting diversity into sport because they're living in villages and they can't get to the sporting opportunities or they're, they're Inuit and they have to go out after school into their villages and go fish and help provide for the families. Um, when I work down in the Southeast, uh, we have a, a challenge with a lot of the, with a fair number of girls whose family comes from um, farm workers or they're working in, in various um types of jobs where the parents need them to support them. And so we have to articulate the value of sport and getting them to play. And there's even been instances um, in when I was down in Arizona where we had to go and knock on the doors of the parents and, and ask their parents if they would let their daughters come to wrestling practice because they couldn't understand why they weren't out there working and helping with the family chores. Uh, up in New York City, a cousin organization beat the streets. There is a really hard time um, just even providing the opportunities. Funding is a barrier to entry. Time is a barrier to entry. If you don't have a car, you're taking a, a train to get from point A to point B, and that starts to cut into your travel time, into your homework time, if you have to hold a job. And so it's really looking at the landscape eyes wide open and, and understanding that there's not one simple answer and that we have to be multidimensional in our approach to inclusion because we do. There's a place for everyone in all of the sports. We just have to understand how do we get them included and, and what does that look like? Yeah, I, I, I would, you nailed it. Um, it's, it's never one thing. It's oftentimes a combination of, of a few things. And I, yeah. I know transportation, for instance, like transportation is also when it comes to, let's just say young athletes, you know, transportation is, is always a barrier. Socioeconomic is, you know, also another barrier. I would say another one is cultural. Um, there's a lot of, you know, especially when it comes to young girls, like in, in different cultures, like there's been a lot of, you know, I've done a lot of work and had multiple conversations about having to convince the family that, they can play sports and that they should be allowed to play sports. So, you know, I would also say more specifically when it comes to non-binary or trans folks, um, just the simple opportunity to register um, is a massive barrier. And then the other one, I mean, oftentimes there just aren't opportunities to register. Um, and so either being forced to sound silent and the other one is safety. Safety is probably the number one. Um, a barrier when it comes to access and opportunity or the lack thereof, um, having a safe space to, to compete. There's pockets that are, you know, starting to happen here or there, but, you know, holistically and in overall, um, it's, it's a major, it's a major issue when it comes to equal access and opportunity. 
Uh, one of the, the things that came out of Title IX that a lot of people don't realize because we often talk about the success that we saw in terms of getting more girls into sports was the impact that it had on women actually coaching sports. And prior to Title IX being passed, there were more women coaches uh, coaching specifically girls and women's sports. And then when Title IX passed, men saw an opportunity there and started infiltrating that space. Um, what, as far as in the spaces that you have both worked in, uh, Sally, I'll, I'll start with you. Have you begun to see more women getting involved with coaching and wrestling and how has that landscape changed? And, and is there an important, is there importance in having more women in that space for young girls to look up to? I want to answer your question in two different compartments. First, overall, yes, we need women coaches. Oh my gosh, because wrestling, I mean, until we get the states to sanction girls wrestling, so girls are wrestling girls, girls are wrestling boys. There is a slew of issues that we have surrounding that. Um, culturally with stigma, we have insecurity issues, confidence issues, and I'm talking about the boys. So I can start talking about the girls too, right? Like it's just a challenging space to have a uh, mixed gendered competition. Um, if we get, when we start to get women coaches, that draws in more girls to compete. We're now getting girls teams. We're getting girls rosters. They're, we're building sisterhood in a way that uh, female coaches are able to really dive in and understand the way that the, the girl brain, the girl, the female athlete brain works. Um, and, and being on an all boys team, I can tell you 100% there is a different way that our brains work whether you're a boy or a girl or um, however you identify, like you think about things differently. Um, for instance, I'll, I'd like to tell you just this quick anecdotal story. Our, our Olympic coach, Terry Steiner, someone went up to him and said, hey, what's the biggest difference to you about coaching a boys college team or the, the women's Olympic team? And he said, there's nothing really different technique wise, strength or skill. He said, but this is one of the things that I had to really learn when I went up to the group of the male wrestlers and I said, do you guys know why we didn't win that match? They would all point to each other and say, because of him, because of him, because of him. And he said, I went up to the same, I went up to my group of female athletes and I said, why didn't we win that match? And every single one of the girls said, it was my fault. <laughs> and when he understood that difference in thinking, he was able to become a better coach and help cultivate that. And I found that, uh, maybe maybe some of our male coaches have had to learn that but our women coaches they already know like hey they're gonna definitely take on a lot emotionally because that's sort of how we're hardwired um so that's that's one facet of it but i would say the the second facet is that as we were going through the ncaa emerging sport process i picked up the phone i called the other emerging sports equestrian rugby um triathlon and i said if you could do one thing differently what would you do and why they, every single one of them gave me the exact same answer. We were not prepared for the critical need for women coaches at the division one level because of that um, men that either didn't want to or weren't qualified to be men's division one coaches came in and took those seats and they sat there and it essentially put in another ceiling for our female coaches. They could no longer progress. They couldn't get those spots because uh, the male coaches weren't leaving. So we looked at that and I took that information back to our group and we said, we need to invest in our women coaches and we have to start doing it. It's critical so that we can continue to give them these opportunities and help them with their evolution. And if we didn't have that information, we, we may have done the exact same thing that all the other sports did. And so now here we are, um, we've got division one programs. We're getting our division one coaches. We know that they haven't had the opportunities to fully get them qualified in the ways that you would have male counterparts. So potentially on a resume, um, they don't look, um, they, they don't maybe compare, but they're getting those positions because our wrestling family understands the critical need for those female coaches. And they're actually the ones that are helping to cultivate and provide. And it's really helpful because we have organizations like the Women's Sport Foundation and, um, and the like that are able to say, hey, we need women coaches. It's incredibly valuable for growing the sport. It's helping to recruit more girls. It's increasing their safety. It's increasing body confidence issues. And overall, if she can see it, uh, she can be it. And these girls are now going on with aspirations beyond the wrestling mat, beyond the, 
be on the sporting arena is to say, I can be a coach, I can be in the media, I can be an administrator, I can be a president, I can do whatever I want to because all of the jobs are open and available for me. That was awesome. I, I think Sally could... needs to give a TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lauren, and I guess with the work that the Women's Sports Foundation has done too, I, I know you're no longer there, but I know that they had a big uh, initiative as far as getting more women into coaching as well. Are you able to expand on that at all? Yeah, you know, Sally, I mean, I, I give you a standing ovation, but nobody wants to see my jeans. Um, you know, <laughs> that was, you, you You said so many key points. One of them that stood out that, you know, is, is so true is that, um, you know, just when those opportunities, when, when first opportunities arrive, or, you know, let's just say presented themselves that just, you know, men took them because they were there, you know, and there weren't, there, there weren't opportunities and or enough up ramp up time to put in, you know, to, to build a pipeline to give more opportunities to qualified women to, to take those positions. And so there are like a number of great things, but you know, the, to, to take it back Anya, to what you said is that, yes, there's a staggering statistic that there has been a steep drop off between women, not only coaching, but in leadership positions when it relates to um, you know, women, women's sports, specifically um, since the passage of, of Title IX, and at the Women's Sports Foundation, um, we actually had a number of reports and studies that ran parallel to that. And um, I had the fortune of being at the foundation at the time. And there were two important funds that were started to start to confront and combat, um, you know, some of those issues, but also to help, you know, begin to build, like I said, that pipeline again. One of them is the Tara Vanderveer, who um, Stanford women's basketball coach, just won a national championship every Hall of Fame. Uh, we have a coaching fund under her name and it's actually across all sports, uh, all women's sports and at the university level. And what we found was that um, one of the issues for uh, women entering into coaching was, you know, lack of pay, it's shocking enough. And um, for anybody who, let's just say use myself, for example, came up through college, after college, I knew I wanted to go right into the coaching ranks. The average salary of an entry level coach couldn't even pay anybody's basic needs. Um, and so oftentimes qualified, you know, passionate individuals who are looking to make that their career would opt into another career choice simply to meet their financial needs. So. Um, there's a fund that was, you know, that was started to help supplement um, entry level coaches and get them to that next level so that they can really pursue their dreams and get into the coaching world and then go on to that next level. Another one, and this is kind of the other side of the coin, which I think is equally as important, is the Scott Pioli uh, Family Fund, which is for um, football coaches and scouts. So it's for women entering into the football, um, in, in, into football. And as we have seen, there's not just benefit of having diversity in women's sports, there's a tremendous benefit in having diversity in leadership and coaching uh, in men's sports. And we've seen that um, through football, there's more and more women on the coaching ranks in the front offices. Um, and then also the MBA, there has been a huge influx. And when I say huge, it's not a tidal wave, but <laughs> comparatively to what we see um, of, you know, Becky Hammond is an example of taking head coaching positions and at WNBA, or excuse me, on an MBA team, we have Swin Cash, who's WNBA player, who's now in the front offices of the uh, New, or New Orleans Pelicans and a lot more examples of how MBA teams have really seen the massive benefit of having women in coaching and leadership positions on the men's side because they offer such a unique and different perspective when it comes to really elevating the game. Um, and so that's the flip side of that is that, you know, yes, women's sports really benefit from having, you know, equal opportunities for women in leadership positions, but so do the men, and there's a huge benefit there as well. 
Yeah, I think oftentimes in terms of the way that we position or talk about women in sports is that it's meant to be inspirational and aspirational for other women, but there's obviously something really positive that comes from men and young boys seeing women in leadership positions or even being coached by women um, at a very early age and seeing that it's possible for them to to learn from these women and be inspired by them that women don't only have to inspire women. Okay. Um, we're, we're getting close to, to wrapping up. And so I wanna make sure that I uh, leave any, just a little bit of time for questions that people may have for Lauren and Sally. I see one question in here um, and it's from Mark Freeman and he wants to know if either one of you had the chance to meet a uh, playwright, Jessica Dickey, who uh, wrote a play called Charles, I've take Charles Ives takes me home, which explores the father daughter relationship against the backdrop of high school and college uh, women's basketball in the 1970s before title nine. I have not heard of this. And so I'm glad it was brought to my attention. I have not, but I'm going to follow that link to learn more. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise, also following. Yeah. Um, if anybody doesn't have any other questions, I want to just first say thank you both for giving us your time tonight and your insight into the different spaces that you both work in. It's very valuable for me to learn, even though sometimes I feel like I know everything in this space. I, I talk to people like you and I realize there's still a lot to learn. So I appreciate both of you so much and I look forward to continuing to see the work that you do in the future. Thank you. And if I may take one bold stand, we're working on getting girls high school wrestling as a sanctioned sport in the state of Pennsylvania. So if any of you happen to know athletic directors, I encourage a phone call just to say, hey, have you thought about adding a women's uh, wrestling program? There's over 400 girls wrestling in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Lauren, anything that you want to plug? Um, I'll plug one thing that I'm doing that's really interesting. One of the clients that I'm working with, um, so 2016, I was the first openly not by a person to run the New York City Marathon. And as of this year, I'm working with the organizers in the New York City Marathon to build out a non-binary category in all of their races, including the New York City Marathon, um, which is a, a, it's a really large step for sports. Um, and obviously very, you know, personal, but, um, what I think is going to be at the beginning of a lot of progress when we talk about that next level of, it, of inclusion and uh, they're really work leading by example here. So um, be on the lookout for that. And um, that's, that's all I got to plug right now. Oh, and go watch the film if you haven't watched it. <laughs> I was actually going to the name of the film. Yeah, it's We Exist beyond the binary and you can go to weexist.co, co, which is the film's website. You can also rent it or buy it on Amazon. I was gonna say if any of you, I, I wanna tell everyone, um, I think we know who we're gonna start following now um, for just sort of inspiration and information. And so if you have anything you wanna throw in the chat, Anya, Sally and Lauren, so people can, can find you um, there it is, we exist.co. Um, you can throw it in now, or we can also share that out later. Um, we're going to follow up with a survey. And so we can, if you, the three of you want to share that with me, um, I will, I will make sure everyone gets that. Um, Sally, were you going to say? Oh, something? I'm, no, I'm typing in this box. Look. Oh, you, you did guys. it. There it is. Twitter, Instagram. Um, but we will, we will send all that out and make sure everyone can get to you, to each of you, um, in as many ways as possible, because this was, um, this was exactly the conversation that I think I, I wanted and knew was coming. And it just feels really great to, to have had the three of you here. Um, we are, we are very lucky to have a space where, um, we are not only allowed, but encouraged um, and, and have sort of the 
the backing of, of um, our community and our leadership to continue to have conversations that matter. Um, and I'm grateful for the three of you to be here with us. And we're going to continue to do that. I promise that. Um, and I'm happy to have made uh, three new friends for the Frick. So <laughs> um, thank you, Anya, for your leadership and, and your, and your mod uh, moderating the panel and, and Sally and Lauren. It's been a pleasure. And we're, again, lucky to have had you here with us in this space. So best to you. Feeling is mutual. Thanks for everyone. Thank for you. Thank you. Thank we'll you. Know, we hope we'll be seeing each other again then. I hope I hope we see you again sometime. Yes. Um, have a great night, everyone. Uh, if you want to watch this again, because I'm going to and take a bunch of notes. <laughs> uh, like I said, you can find it on, you can go to the Frick website, you can go to our YouTube page, uh, social media, you can find it somehow. And have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Bye. much.